Sí, hola, vale. Eh, buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Continuamos con el seminario, el tercer bloque que hemos llamado Políticas y Sujetos Insostenibles, en el que vamos a explorar un poco pues, cómo esta crisis civilizatoria está impactando tanto la configuración de los sistemas de poder como los patrones de producción de subjetividad. Para ello contamos primero con Razmiz Keuchellán, yes. Uf, qué difícil. Eh, <risa> que es doctor en Sociología, da clases en la Universidad de Burdeos y ha trabajado pues, toda una línea de ecología política con ese libro tan interesante que ha citado antes Yayo. Así que bueno, Razmi, todo tuyo. Gracias. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me and for organizing this very, very interesting conference. Unfortunately, I will be speaking in, in English because it is easier for me to do so. But uh, I understand Castellano, so you can ask me questions uh, later in Spanish uh, if you want during the discussion. I will try not to talk for too long so as to leave time, a maximum time, uh, for the debate. And of course, if I speak too fast or if some things are not clear enough or you make signs and I'll try to slow down, I hope everything is fine from the translator's point of view. The title of my talk is The Rise of Eco-Nationalism. And by eco-nationalism, I mean new forms of nationalism based on climate change, on the crisis of natural resources, oil, water, minerals, for instance, or on biodiversity losses. Now, since the beginning of modernity, nationalism has been linked in very complex ways to nature, to certain representations of nature, and also to forms of appropriation of natural resources. This was true for extreme forms of nationalism, namely fascisms, historical fascisms, not the fascisms of today, historical fascisms who had a very specific conception of space and of nature. But this is also true for more ordinary forms of nationalism. But with climate change, of course, this relationship between nationalism and nature has transformed itself greatly. Hence, I will be interested here not so much with climate change itself, but with some economic and geopolitical consequences of the environmental crisis. In fact, this crisis, the environmental crisis, has impacts on all aspects of human life, and also at different scales, local, national, and international. My main point of interest here will be how do the military, the main armies of the world, think about climate change? And they think about climate change a lot, in fact. The first part of my talk will be concerned with the link between climate change and the question of terrorism. Now, apparently, there is no relationship between the two. These seem to be two very different phenomena. But in the mind of the military today, in military doctrines that have emerged since, say, the years 2000, there is a very clear relationship, and I want to try to give you a sense of what this relationship is. I will be concerned in the this first part of my talk with the way the great armies of the world reflect upon the military consequences of climate change. Eco-nationalism constructs itself both in relationship with the crisis of natural resources and in fact with terrorism. The second part of my talk will be concerned with the Arctic. The Arctic is becoming today one of the main battlegrounds where this eco-nationalism I was talking about is emerging today. It is the place where new forms of environmental imperialisms emerge and compete. And it is also a matter of great concern for the military strategists today. So this is the program, more or less. First part of the talk. In 2010, President Barack Obama signed an official document called the National Security Strategy, the NSS it is called. This document, for the first time, included a section devoted to the military implications of climate change. This document, the NSS, said the following. Given the impact of climate change upon the environment and also population, it is imperative for the US Army to integrate its consequences into its strategic calculations. In other words, 
Climate change will have an impact on military strategy and activity in the future, and the US Army should adapt itself to this new situation. The NSS, the National Security Strategy, is updated approximately every five to 10 years. The previous report dated back to the year 2002. This was during George W. Bush's first term. In fact, it was released just after 9-11. And this previous version included, among other things, the doctrine of preventive war, whose application in Iraq was being prepared at the time, in 2002. Now, the function of the NSS is precisely to acknowledge the major political and military tendencies playing out on the world scale. For instance, the end of the Cold War, the emergence of global terrorism, the increase in oil prices that will have an impact on the economy, for instance, or the risks of pandemics, of global diseases. This document, the NSS, allows the US ruling classes to determine the country's medium and long-term strategic objectives. Now, the publication of the NSS is always preceded by debates on these themes within the ruling administration, in think tanks and journals associated with foreign policy, and also in the media. Hence, in the second half of the years 2000, several expert commissions put together by these think tanks published reports concerning the link between climate change and war, more precisely, the impact of climate change on war making. And most of these commissions included high-ranking officers from the various parts of the armed forces, for instance, the Navy, the Army, Air Forces, and the Coast Guard also. Now, to give you one example, one of these reports was entitled The Age of Consequences, the foreign policy and national security implications of global climate change. This report was issued in 2009 by the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the Center for a New American Security. The age of consequences in the title of the report refers to a speech given by Winston Churchill upon the eve of the Second World War. It is defined by this report as the age that would see, and I quote, the intersection of climate change and the security of nations, end of quote. Now, this report claims that we have entered an age where the behavior of human beings will have an impact on the environment and that climate change in return will have an impact on one of the oldest activities human beings engage in, war making. War will be overdetermined in the future by the environmental crisis, for instance, by the increasing number of natural catastrophes, or climate migrations, or rising sea levels, for instance. And this report out outlined three possible scenarios regarding climate change for the 21st century. First scenario, what it calls expected climate change, with global temperatures increasing by 1.3 degrees by 2040. Second scenario, so-called severe climate change, with temperatures rising by 2.6 degrees, giving rise to so-called non-linear environmental events. And non-linear simply means unpredictable, unpredictable environmental events. And finally, third scenario, a catastrophic scenario based on temperatures increasing by 5.6 degrees Celsius by 2100. Now, in this third scenario, climate change will threaten the inter internal cohesion of nations, according to this report. Each of these scenarios, according to the report, has different implications for the way the armed forces will be mobilized in the context of climate change. In 2009, the CIA founded a Center for Climate Change and, natural, and National Security. Its task, firstly, is to reflect upon the effects that climate change has on national security. It is also, secondly, to provide strategic information to the US negotiators that take part in international conferences on climate change. Now, when negotiators participate in international conferences on climate change, 
they receive strategic information so as to benefit from a full knowledge of the issues at stake. And this is precisely the kind of information this new CIA center provides U.S. negotiators. Other secret services in other countries play the same role for their own negotiators, of course. In 2010, the Pentagon also published a report devoted to the strategic implications of environmental change. According to this report, climate change will affect the armed forces' missions in several ways. For instance, it will increase natural disasters and hence it will have an impact on military installations. Now, as you know, the US has many military bases around the world, more than 800 bases, in fact, in more than 60 countries. US imperialism, in fact, relies on this network of bases to implement itself. However, and this is the important point, many of these US military bases around the world are already under threat from rising sea levels. One of the main US military hubs in the Indian Ocean is a base situated on the island of Diego Garcia. This island of Diego Garcia is a stopping point for many American ships and aircraft in transits to or from Asia. In fact, this base was already a strategic hub during the Cold War. With China's rising power, it has taken on decisive importance in the US military deployment. Yet, and this is the important point, Diego Garcia stands only a few meters above sea level, and rising sea levels threaten to engulf it, perhaps around the middle of the 21st century. So, the armies fear for their infrastructures in the context of climate change. U.S. imperialism could be put in jeopardy because of rising sea levels, of course, if nothing is done. Now, the military's concern over climate change crystallized over the course of the years 2000, more or less. But the U.S. elite's first reflections on the military implications of climate change came much earlier. The first report explicitly referring to this problem was in fact ordered by President Jimmy Carter. It dates back to 1977. And even before that, the Pentagon organized in June 1947 a meeting devoted to the military consequences of ice melting in the Arctic. I will come back to the issue of the Arctic in the second part of my talk. A series of consequences about climate change also took place within NATO. NATO is now at the forefront of addressing this question of the link between climate change and war. In 2008, the General Secretary of NATO, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, argued, and I quote, that no single government can confront climate change on its own. And the reason for this is that climate change is by its very nature a problem that transcends nas uh, national boundaries. It is by its essence a global problem. And it shares its, this characteristic of being an essentially global problem with terrorism, in fact, because terrorist networks also transcend borders. Hence, climate change requires new modalities of international cooperation. And for this reason, according to Rasmussen, NATO could, in the future, play a key role in managing climate change's effects on collective security. NATO, as you know, went through an identity crisis after the end of the Cold War because its purpose, fighting against the Soviet Union, well, had simply disappeared. But with climate change, it has tried to find a new purpose for the 21st century. The American military is not the only one interested in climate change. Over recent years, all the world's major armed forces have investigated the military consequences of this phenomenon, from Britain to China, Brazil, India, France, Canada, etc. In 2010, one of the main journals of military thinking in France, the Revue de Défense Nationale, devoted a special issue to climate geostrategy, as well as to the notion of nat natural security. Natural security means the crisis of natural resources puts the security of nations in jeopardy. In 2012, the French National Assembly 
devoted a parliamentary report to the impact of climate change on defense and security. This report advanced the hypothesis that in the future, the army could play the role of a chaos specialist. Now, this notion of chaos specialist is a very interesting one, which one can find in many military reports about climate change. Its meaning is the following. It's a very interesting one, it seems to me. The ecological crisis will lead to an aggravation of natural disasters, making the existing political and economic institutions more fragile. This will particularly be the case in developing regions. In many cases, the army will be the only force capable of intervening to deal with the resulting chaos in an effective manner. Developments of this order are particularly expected in the three zones of strategic interest for the European Union, as identified by this report I was talking about, that is the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Southwest Asia, and the Arctic. Hence, chaos specialist means that the armies of the West, in this case the French army, increasingly consider themselves as specializing in the chaos that climate change will create in different parts of the world. In other words, the armies will be the last standing institutions in a generalized chaos induced by climate change. Hence, the armies think that a militarization of climate change will take place in the decades to come. Now, these and many other examples I could have quoted show that the militaries are taking climate change very seriously. And in a moment, I will try to explain why that is the case in more details. This proliferation of military reports concerning the problem of climate change and the detail with which it is discussed by the military reveal the difficulties that other segments of the ruling classes have in getting to grips with it. And by other segments, I mean the political class. Militaries are today one of the sectors of the elite that are capable of reflecting over a, th over a 30 to 50 year horizon which is precisely the appropriate temporality for considering the effects of climate change on societies. Militaries know how to think in the medium and long term. That's my point. For its part, on the contrary, the political class is the victim of short-termism. This leaves it unable to integrate climate change into its thinking. Indeed, today, politicians' exclusive objective seems to be to get re-elected at elections that are at most spaced out a few years apart, leaving them unable to take into account more long-term problems, well, like climate change. In fact, climate change is essentially a problem in temporality, a problem of resource management in time. Different segments of the elite have different ways of projecting them themselves in time because of the structural constraints they respond to. Militaries are accustomed to planning for the medium and long term, in fact. Three to five decades is the temporality for strategic analysis. It is the time that the Cold War lasted, for example. Militaries are also accustomed to handling uncertainty. And for this reason, they do not find the element of uncertainty inherent in climate change impossible to handle. The most famous book of military strategy written in modern times is Karl von Clausewitz on war, published in 1832. Now, as you know, Clausewitz was a famous Prussian general defeated in the Napoleonic Wars. In On War, Clausewitz says the following, and I quote, this is a great quote, I think. The great uncertainty of all data in war is a Peculiar, peculiar difficulty because all action must, to a certain extent, be planned in a mere twilight, which in addition, like the effect of a fog or moonshine, gives to things exaggerated dimensions and an unnatural appearance." End of quote. This is Clausewitz. What he says in this quote is that he underscores the fundamental uncertainty that is inherent to war. 
Now, in a sense, what climate change does is that it radicalizes this element of uncertainty which is characteristic of war. It makes the battlegrounds even more uncertain. Clausewitz also says that factors like hydrography, vegetation, and temperatures play a decisive role in battle's outcome. His point, Clausewitz's point, is that if you want to win a battle, you have to know the battlefield. That is, all the different natural elements that the battlefield is composed of. Now, the great question today is, what happens when the battlefield becomes more and more uncertain and changing with climate change? Well, control of the knowledge of the battlefield is likely to become a very important issue in the context of a changing environment. The bottom line is that today, the level of preparation for climate change of the military and the resources they have to deal with it, particularly coercive resources, seems far superior to the ones that other sections of the ruling classes have. And this is, of course, a worrying observation. The fact that the military are more advanced in the preparation for climate change means that climate change might become an opportunity for them well, to increase their share of power in the future. There's a philosopher named Hans Jonas who was a student of the great German philosopher Martin Heidegger. It is interesting to quote in this context. Hans Jonas is the author of a famous book called The Imperative of Responsibility, published in 1979. Now in this book, Jonas argues for the emergence of what he calls a benevolent dictatorship to stop climate change, the environmental crisis. Jonas's argument is that democracies are unable to find solutions to the environmental crisis. And the reason for this is that democratic deliberation takes too long and it is too messy and contradictory. But democracies are by essence interested in the short term. What is needed to find a solution to climate change, according to Jonas, well, is precisely a benevolent dictatorship. A dictatorship in the Roman sense, which will save society and then, of course, hopefully restore democracy. And in this context, according to Jonas, humanity will perhaps have to accept a halt to its liberty as the necessary price for its physical well-being. This is what Jonas calls, and I quote, tyranny as an alternative to physical annihilation. The annihilation brought upon humanity by climate change, precisely. So ecological thought has authoritarian strands, of course, and Hans Jonas represents, in a sense, one of these strands. Now let's dig, dig a little deeper in this question. What is the link between the ecological crisis and the conduct of war as militaries see it? Here, the relationship between climate change and the question of terrorism will appear more clearly. First of all, according to the military, the multiplication of natural disasters implies that armies will be increasingly called on to come to the aid of populations. Natural disasters will lead to situations of civil unrest, conflicts, or even civil wars. And the armies are going to have to come in to reestablish order. Two examples illustrating this tendency are the 2004 tsunami in the Indian Ocean and the 2005 uh, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. These were two large-scale natural catastrophes which were both very heavily militari militarized tragedies. That is, the military were very much involved in the management of these tragedies. Well, you all remember the pictures of the US National Guard patrolling in the flooded streets of New Orleans. In other words, in the future, the military will be more and more directly involved in rescue operations and so-called peacekeeping. The military fear that the means that will be deployed during these kinds of operations will not be used for other missions, included in, including in conventional wars. The United States, in particular, has to deal with this problem, given that it is already engaged in very costly wars, with very uncertain outcomes in Iraq and Afghanistan. It is more indirectly involved, it, it is also more indirectly involved in different places of the world. Hence, the military are basically worried that climate change will induce a growth of their workload. 
Here a very important category of contemporary military thinking should be introduced, which is the category of failed states. In the military's eyes, climate change risks undermining certain states that are already weak and strategically sensitive. These are the famous failed states, which have been theorized by the Pentagon since the 90s, since at least the Bill Clinton administration. Now, failed states are those states consider incapable, considered incapable of providing the normal functions of a modern, modern democratic state, that is security, justice, equality before law, the law, etc. For the most part, these failed states are situated in the global south. Each year, Foreign Policy, which is the journal founded by Samuel Huntington, which, who is the author of The Clash of Civilizations, publishes a ranking of these states called the Failed States Index. Foreign Policy is a very influential journal in the foreign policy establishment, which has also been at the forefront of military thinking about climate change. There are around 50 of these failed states, and it is a list that develops from year to year. In 2010, for instance, Somalia was the world's most failed state, followed by Chad and Sudan. Haiti was the most failed non-African state, and Afghanistan the most failed Asian state. This ranking is established every year on the base basis of a dozen criteria, more or less. Every country gets a score on each of these points, ranging from demographic pressure to the existence of public services, government legitimacy, economic development, etc. Now, one hypothesis advanced by numerous geostrategists since the end of the Cold War is that the breeding ground for 21st century conflicts will be weak states and, in particular, failed states. The essayist Robert Kaplan notably advanced this argument in an influential article written in 1994 entitled The Coming Anarchy. The com very influential article. The anarchy evoked in this title will be the result of the breakup of the balances of the Cold War era. The vectors of the conflicts of the 20th century were strong states, as you know. This was true of both the two world wars in, in which the main world power clashed, but also of the Cold War. During the Cold War, there were numerous proxy wars among weak nations, in particular in the Third World. But these conflicts were overdetermined by relations between superpowers. Today, peace reigns among strong states, even if they do directly or indirectly cause plenty of conflicts in the rest of the world, of course. And world, war, sorry, war has been displaced to weak states or failed states. Now, the problem with failed states is that they harbor terrorist networks. Iraq. Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen, for instance, are all, all failed states, and they are all places where terrorists have settled and launched their attacks on Western countries. The more these countries sink into chaos, the more their economies encounter difficulty, the more they will become fertile ground for terrorist networks to take advantage from. And since climate change will aggravate their condition, well, climate change will make the problem of terrorism worse in the future. The conclusion of this argument is very simple. Military's concern over climate change is closely linked to the dominant strateg strategic paradigm of the post-Cold War period, which is the struggle against terrorism. The reading of climate change is overdetermined by a central concern that they had even before 9-11, and which 9-11 even further intensified. For the armed forces, terrorism and climate change, first of all, have in common the fact that they are both transnational phenomena that no one state can fight alone. That's, that is why this phenomena, terrorism, may well help rejuvenate international organizations like NATO, as I said. But there is also a second link between terrorism and the ecological crisis, in that this crisis provides a breeding ground for terrorism to prosper, especially in failed states. Climate change and the struggle against terrorism are therefore two phenomena that the militaries consider 
in close combination with one another. So much for the first part of the, of the talk. How much time do I have left? I didn't calculate. Yeah, okay, no problem. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So I'd like to say a few words. Mas lento, all right, no problem. I'd like to say now a few words about the political economy and geopolitics of the Arctic. Most reports or documents devoted to the military consequences of climate change include a section on the Arctic. In fact, the military mind is really fascinated by the North Pole. The Antarctic in the South does not exert the same seductive power, it seems to me. And the reason for this is that it is at some distance, the Antarctic, from the main sea routes and also from the conflicts that structured the 20th century, especially the conflict between the US and Russia during the Cold War. In fact, it is not, it is not only military figures who are fascinated by the Arctic. James Lovelock, who is the father of the Gaia theory, recently said that when global warming reaches unsustainable levels in our countries, well, the last surviving humans will move to take refuge in the Arctic. One thing is certain, the Arctic is melting, and increasingly quickly. A NASA, NASA finance study published in early 2011 tells us that in 2006 alone, the two poles decreased by 475 billion tons of ice. Since 1992, the rate at which the poles are melting has increased by 36 billion tons each year. Among other disastrous consequences, this will contribute to sea levels rising 15 centimeters by 2050. Since records began in the 1950s, temperatures have increased in the Arctic twice as quickly as the global average rate. Almost all the glaciers there are shrinking. Now, this military fascination for the Arctic is not a new phenomenon. During the Cold War, the North Pole was a major concern of the world's major armed forces, and in particular, the US and the Soviet militaries. In fact, a significant part of the scientific knowledge concerning this region first originated from research programs financed by the US armed forces. For instance, launching a guided missile or navigating a deep sea submarine requires, of course, mastering Mas despacio. All right. Sorry about that. For instance, launching a guided missile or navigating a deep sea submarine requires mastering the environmental conditions in which they operate. This, in fact, bring us, brings us back to Clausewitz. If you want to win a battle, you have to know and control the battleground. That is particularly true in a hostile environment like the Arctic. A 1950 U.S. military study devoted to the Arctic explains that, I quote, emphasis must be accorded to those unique environmental features that presently impose the chief obstacles to the conduct of military operations in the Arctic, end of quote. The attention the, that the Americans devoted to the Arctic during the Cold War is not hard to explain. Alaska and Siberia are border regions separated by the Bering Straits. The shortest route for Soviet bombers or missiles to reach American cities passed via the North Pole. American strategists also contemplated the possibility of the Arctic becoming the theater of a hot war between the superpowers. And this, of course, implied the need to prepare equipment and tactics appropriate to this environment. At the time, in fact, it was accepted that the Soviets were, were more advanced than the Americans in this regard. Now, the Cold War is over, but militaries are still very much interested in the Arctic. 
The fact that the ice is melting at an accelerated rate, combined with the geopolitical and economic upheavals of recent decades, has changed the situation in the region. Since 2007, the Northwest Passage linking the Atlantic and the Pacific has been open for two weeks a year. Some predict that in the years to come, it may be open for the whole summer. In August 2009, two German commercial ships, which were not accompanied by icebreakers, took the Northeast Passage, or the so-called Northern Sea Route, along the northern coast of Siberia, reaching the Netherlands from Vladivostok. And this passage is now open for four or five months a year. The fact that the Arctic is becoming navigable does not mean that it will be easily navigable in the future, of course. The Arctic remains an unhospitable region, and icebergs and other moving ice can potentially inflict major damage on ships. Given that it is difficult to predict how the ice moves, journey times promise to vary greatly, of course, in time. But the increasing navigability of the Arctic will have a considerable economic and geopolitical impact. Within 20 years, the navigability of Arctic sea routes will become a reality. Journey time from continent to continent will be sharply reduced. This will reduce the quantities of fuel used and the price of the commodities transported, and it will also accelerate globalization, evidently. To give you specific examples of this, ships that today travel from Rotterdam to Yokohama, both of them cargo ports of global importance, as you know, through the Suez Canal, will have 40% shorter journeys when they instead take the North Northeast Passage. Navigating from Seattle to Rotterdam through the Northwest Passage, rather than via the Panama Canal, will mean a 25% faster journey. Hence, globalization will accelerate with ice melting in the Arctic. The melting of the Arctic ice also raises issues of sovereignty. Five countries have expressed sovereignty claims in the Arctic. The USA, Russia, Denmark, Norway, and Canada. These countries make up the Arctic Council, which is an intergovernmental forum founded in 1996, which is responsible for handling conflicts in the region. In July 2007, a Russian submarine expedition planted the tit titanium flag on the Lomonosov Ridge near the North Pole. Now, Russia considers this ridge an underwater extension of its own territory. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, agreed in the 1990s, uh, 1970s, sorry, says that any country that can demonstrate that its continental shelf extends more than 200 nautical miles beyond its shoreline has rights over exploiting the resources it founds there. It finds there. Now, the Lomonosov Ridge is, of course, rich in mineral, minerals and oil. This explains Russia's eagerness to establish control over it. The attractiveness of this region's, region is also explained by the fact that with global warming, certain species, notably fish, are migra migrating further north. Denmark and Canada each contest Russia's claims to this territory. While the Danes maintain that the ridge is an extension of Greenland, the Canadians insist that it is Canada's, of course. And the fact that the Arctic is a circle makes such conflicts difficult to resolve, say, from a strictly geographical point of view. Now, some commentators fear that this kind of conflict, of territorial conflict in the Arctic, may in, future, in the future lead to open warfare between these countries. They think that the division of the Arctic, they think the division of the Arctic uh, through the prism of the 19th century scramble for Africa. That is to say, it is likely, according to them, to give rise to new forms of inter-imperialist conflicts. At this stage, the fear of major conflicts emerging in the Arctic seems 
Well, unlikely, it seems to me. A good part of the resources found in the Arctic are situated within uncontested borders. Moreover, in such a hostile environment, interstate cooperation is, is more rational than conflict. That is not to say that we can rule out such a risk for the decades to come, of course. In 2011, for instance, the Canadian army carried out the largest military exercise in its history in this very region. The Russians military dominant in North Pole also because they have over 20 icebreakers, some of which are nuclear. By comparison, the US only have three icebreakers of this kind. In fact, building a latest generation icebreaker takes between eight to 10 years, and it costs, of course, a lot of, a lot of money. The melting of the Arctic ice will also have indirect geopolitical consequences. It will alter the importance of certain strategic regions and give importance to some other places. I give you one example. A large proportion of the commodities heading to and coming from Asia, a third of total world trade, passes through the Strait of Malacca, which is situated between Malaysia and the Indonesian island of Sumatra. Now, guaranteeing the security of the strait has for centuries been a great problem. Since the origins of international trade, the Strait of Malacca has been, for instance, infested with pirates. Moreover, China's emergence as a world power and its rivalry with uh, the United States risk fueling the struggle for military supremacy in this region, the Strait of Malacca, as well as in the China Sea, to which it offers access, in fact. And the opening of Arctic routes could become, well, a serious alternative to this waterway in the future. I think I will go to my conclusion now. I had some other things to say, but maybe we can come back to this and the discussion. So I want to move towards my conclusion so as to leave place for the, the debate. The melting of the Arctic ice is an interesting opportunity to reflect upon the relationship between capitalism and the environmental crisis. Here's a famous quote taken from Karl Marx. According to Marx, and I quote here, while capital must on one side strive to tear down every spatial barrier to intercourse, to exchange and conquer the whole earth for its market, it strives on the other side to annihilate this space with time, that is, to reduce to a minimum the time spent in motion from one place to another. The more developed the capital, therefore, the more extensive the market over which it circulates, which forms the spatial orbit of its circulation. The more does it strive simultaneously for an even greater extension of the market and for greater annihilation of space by time." End of quote. According to Marx, capital has an inherent tendency to con conquer the world as a whole and to turn it into a gigantic market. Marx, in fact, writes in Capital that the world market is contained in the very notion of capital. In other words, capitalism is by essence a global and dynamic system that perpetually expands its frontiers. Why? Well, the reason for this is that capital periodically suffers crises and that expanding globally is a way to solve these crises, at least temporarily. However, capitalism's global expansion comes at a price. It generates its own difficulties. The greater the distance between the commodity's site of production and the site of its sale, the more its cost increases. And the reason for this is that transport isn't free, of course. It weighs on the rate of profit. The further you export, the more transport will cost. And this implies that capitalism must, must constantly accelerate commodities' speed of circulation in order to minimize their transporting co costs and maximize the profits that capitalists draw from them. The profits that they make depend on the speed 
of circulation of commodities increasing. And this is precisely what Marx means by the annihilation of space by time, acceleration. Since the 19th century, it has been possible to accelerate the speed of capital circulation by using fossil fuels, coal and then oil. Coal and oil have served to propel, propel ever faster means of transport, trains, cars, boats, planes, etc. These ever faster means of transport have helped capitalism overcome the problem of the rising costs of transport in the context of the globalization of capitalism. Following in the wake of Marx, the Marxist geographer David Harvey has drawn attention to one of capitalism's modes of crisis re resolution, which he refers to using the concept of the spatial fix, you may have heard. Now, this concept of the spatial fix has two meanings. One of them is literal and the other is metaphorical. The literal one refers to the idea that capitalism is a spatial entity which takes over, fixes itself in its environment and transforms deeply this environment. It materializes in machines, means of transport and modes of communication. The metaphorical meaning of the concept instead refers to the idea of solving the, pro of solving the problem of crisis, as in to fix something. But this is a solution that is only temporary and illusory, according to David Harvey. One of the ways in which capital resolves the crises is spatial in character. More precisely, it moves capitals to what were previously virgin lands lacking capitalist relations. This concept of the spatial fix allows Harvey to argue that what Marx called Primitive accumulation is not only primitive, in fact, in the sense of characterizing only the early days of capitalism. Primitive accumulation is repeated in cycles across the course of history, each time that a crisis of capitalist overaccumulation has to be resolved. That's the point. Now, with the climate crisis, the annihilation of space by time reaches, it seems to me, a new stage of its history such as not even Marx could have predicted it, it seems to me. Capitalism, of course, is still capitalism, and as such, it is subject to crisis, which it can temporarily overcome through spatial fixes. But this process is now caught up with environmental problems, which it will seek to profit from by taking up the opportunities that are provided, I talked about. What we are today seeing in the Arctic, especially, these new imperialistic tendencies I was describing thus owe to both very old and very new tendencies. Old ones in that the scramble for the Arctic is underpinned by the centuries-old logic of capitalist profit. But also new ones in that this logic is now mixed with another one, the logic of climate change. Future crises of capitalism will be both economic and ecological and they will only more clearly show the need to establish a link between ecology and the critique of the capitalist system. Thank you very much. Bien, usted ha hablado de que, eh, por un lado, que el, el, la, el, el complejo militar industrial americano planificaba a largo, te, a largo término, pero no lo hacía el capital americano, por decirlo así. Eh, esto yo no lo veo claro porque el... el el complejo militar e industrial no es independiente de, de, del capitalismo americano. Es decir, está a sus órdenes, por decir. El ejército, el ejército americano, que sí que Eisenhower le, puso, le paró los pies en un momento determinado porque tenía una influencia, porque es una industria en el fondo y es una industria privada, en donde hay muchos intereses privados. Es una parte del capitalismo 
Entonces, eh, que, que, que no se puede decir que sea un poder militar, porque el poder militar en realidad no lo hay, hay el poder del capitalismo. Entonces, el, el complejo militar industrial no, eh, hace estudios a largo término, pero es que estos estudios a largo término ya se saben. Ha habido muchos estudios científicos que dicen lo mismo, no aportan nada de original. Y esto lo sabe el capitalismo americano también. Y lo sabe el Trump, a pesar de que dice que niega... El, el, pero eso lo saben... Eh, la, es, es, es innegable. Detrás lo saben. Lo que pasa es que les interesa eh, sacar beneficios de lo que han invertido en eh, energías eh, no renovables. Eh, y en fin, dicen que, al menos el Trump, dice que no lo sabe. Pero en realidad hay gente que dice que lo sabe perfectamente. Entonces, eh, yo pienso que... El, el capital militar industrial puede decir lo que pasará, pero no pone ninguna solución al problema. Es decir, eso demuestra que no está desligado del capital, del capital eh, económico y tal. Está a su servicio. Y por otra parte, eh, ya decía Rosa Luxemburgo, que el capitalismo, como ha dicho usted, necesita a cada crisis solucionarla a través de la conquista de nuevos mercados y, y, y explotarlos ¿no? para, para estar a la disposición. Pero el problema es que el, el capitalismo ya no tiene nuevos mercados porque domina en todo el mundo. Ha llegado a su límite y ha llegado a su límite también ecológico. Pero no aportará nada a la solución militar. Lo que vemos es que invierten cada vez más dinero y más eh, bombas eh, destructivas y lo que está claro aquí es que el problema de la crisis ecológica es que habrá cada vez una, un interés más grande por los recursos eh, limitados de, de este mundo. Esto se ve venir y el peligro de guerra mundial se plantea aquí. ¿Puedo responder? Sí. Creo que con muchas cosas que usted ha dicho. No estoy diciendo, por supuesto, que el sistema militar hoy está buscando una solución que es en nuestro mejor interés como personas, por supuesto for the subaltern classes. This is not what I said. What I said is that the military is more and more thinking about climate change in the interest of the ruling classes. I don't know if they'll find solutions to climate change. In fact, I'm not sure they will find solutions that will be you know, in our interest. I'm sure they will not. But this does not mean that they are not thinking about climate change, its effects, on their own profession, on what they do, which is dominate through the military. So this is a point I want to make very clear. I'm not saying there are military solutions to climate change, obviously. I'm saying that we should take seriously the fact that some sectors of the dominant classes, and especially the military, are, well, thinking very hard about the consequences of climate change on their business, on the way they do business, okay? So this is a very important distinction. Of course, I'm not arguing in favor of the militarization of climate change, far from it. In fact, I'm really uh, arguing for the, for the opposite. But that doesn't mean that we have uh, to be blind about the fact. There's a, there's a sense in the left that the dominant classes are not doing anything about climate change. This is profoundly wrong, I think. The, the ruling classes, and especially the military, are thinking about climate change very hard. But in their interests, not in our interests, are as subordinate classes. Okay, so this is one very important point. The second point is that, is there an autonomy of the military as regard to the capitalist class. My way of thinking about this relationship between politics, the military, and the economy is very much influenced by Gramsci and Pulanzas also, which are uh, political types of Marxism. And Gramsci and Pulanzas think that, of course, the military and politics in modern societies are very much under uh, the influence of capitalism, obviously, but also that they have some form of Relative autonomy is Pulanzas' expression, a form of relative autonomy. In other words, the military is a specific sector or segment of the ruling classes. Of course, it has ties with the capitalist classes, especially in the US, but also in France, and I guess also in Spain and other places. But it also has its own agenda. And in fact, if we read, if, you, if, we, if we're interested in what modern history shows, well, sometimes the military take over power. It happens, and it may well happen in the future. So these are the two points I would maybe a bit disagree, disagree with you, but on the rest I fully agree. With your general perspective, I, I agree. Uh, 
No, Iván. No, eh, solo quiero decir que eh, usted dice que el sistema capitalista eh, tiene el cambio climático para sus propios impone soluciones para sus propios intereses. Ya. Pero yo pienso que en realidad todos tenemos los mismos intereses, porque estamos en, so. en, en un punto en que si se destruye la humanidad como se destruye, es que no sé qué van a ganar los capitalistas. Entonces es, parece que es un, un tren desbocado que va hacia el desastre. Como decía Walter Reagan. Humanity is not going to be destroyed. This is not what is at stake for a foreseeable future. What is at stake is that some parts of humanities in the global south and of course also the subaltern classes in the north are going to suffer greatly from the effects of climate change. But this is not the annihilation of the whole of humankind, of course. So we, we should look at this very seriously, I think. In the foreseeable future, we're not talking about uh, the annihilation of humankind in general. What we're talking about is who is going to bear uh, the effects of climate change, and of course it's going to be uh, the working classes, the subaltern classes, etc. So this I uh, would disagree with you. I don't think we're facing the end of humanity here. Sí. sí, hola, buenas tardes. Eh, a ver, los augurios son terribles. Um, ayer fue una sesión de cambio climático, crisis energética. Hoy en, en, se ha expuesto que bueno, hay ciertos sectores muy interesados en el control absoluto de hasta incluso nuestra desgracia y de nuestro colapso. Y uh, nosotros estamos cómodamente sentados en estas mm, sillas que no son demasiado cómodas. Uh, bien, la ciudadanía desde hace mucho tiempo mm, dejó de um, sentirse responsable de su propio futuro. Estamos en el mundo capitalista, el capitalismo ha hecho muy buen trabajo ¿eh? y creo que ahora nos toca, porque es que nos va el futuro, porque lo vamos a pasar bastante mal. Entonces, eh, me encanta, he, he mirado un poco el, el pequeño currículum que está aquí, y Rasmik es un activista de la izquierda radical suiza. Bien, es que es una de las claves. Es decir, eh, o nos empoderamos, esta famosa palabra, ¿no? que ha perdido ya todo su valor, desde un punto de vista político, desde un punto de vista ecológico, etcétera, etcétera, y intentamos marcar nuestro propio futuro o realmente los augurios son muy malos. Y aquí, y se seguirá un poco con la, con la siguiente ponente, Yayo Herrero, yo como mujer me siento horrorizada de lo que puede pasar. Porque justamente las mujeres vamos a, tener, um, vamos a pagar el pato de, de una forma muy desastrosa. Eh, los estados con un cierto bienestar y donde hay unas ciertas democracias han permitido a las mujeres bueno, pues, eh, ir mm, ocupando unos espacios que les son legítimos. Ante este colapso que, que, que se viene encima, las mujeres lo vamos a pasar muy mal. Por tanto, aquí hay una gran labor por parte de las mujeres y evidentemente de los hombres. ¿eh? Pero la, por lo que a mí respecta, eh, tenemos un futuro muy negro que tenemos que mm, activarnos de una forma muy, muy intensa. En lo político, en, desde el activismo social, etcétera, etcétera, hay, hay diversos caminos, pero me parece que no nos podemos quedar cómodamente sentados en estos asientos. Gracias. Eh, teniendo en cuenta que yo sí que creo que el ejército tiene una autonomía particular, y además unas condiciones estructurales que le permite pues, ver a un plazo mayor. Una pregunta que es muy polémica, pero tiene que ver con... Y además, teniendo en cuenta que el ejército, cuando se habla de relaciones de poder, casi siempre tiene la última palabra un Estado moderno, ¿cómo se tiene que replantear la izquierda emancipadora su relación con los ejércitos de cara a estos escenarios? Porque solemos ser, y es normal que lo seamos, muy reacios a cualquier tipo de, de planteamiento de cambio que involucre a un ejército. ¿Pero eso es razonable en un contexto como este? I don't have an answer to this, uh, but this is a very important question, of course, to know how the left should relate to uh, the, the military. I just want to say one thing, it's not an answer to your question, but in the past, uh, classical Marxists, and I mean Gramsci, but also Lenin, but also Marx, etc., were uh, readers of military strategy. I quoted Clausewitz, well, Lenin had written 
uh, lots of articles about Clausewitz, and it is the case of Gramsci also, it is the case of Lukács, etc. So these Marxists, paid, these radicals, paid attention to what the military uh, were thinking about the current situation, their time. This is something that in contemporary critical theories uh, doesn't exist anymore. And the main thinkers we talked about, for instance, David Harvey or Frederick Jameson or Alain Badiou or Jacques Rancière, the main critical thinkers, they're not Marxist anymore, but or Ernesto Laclau, you cannot find the trace of, you know, interests about what the military today are thinking about climate change or, in fact, any other subject matter. So there was an attention that was paid historically in Marxist currents in the workers' movement to what military strategists thought about, say, climate change today, but other subjects. And this has disappeared. And this seems to be, uh, to, to me, a, a, a very important problem. And because it uh, doesn't help us understand how the dominant classes, how the ruling classes of the world, well, think about contemporary problems. I know this is not an answer to your question, but it is maybe part, a small part of the answer. So we should read the military on climate change or anything else. Eh, posturas de, sobre el cambio climático de presidentes de Estados Unidos como Trump, etc., ¿pueden cambiar alguna, eh, o sea, variar un poco la estrategia militar o de la CIA que has dicho tú sobre, al respecto de este tema? Uh, you mean Trump arriving today? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I don't know. I'm not sure. As you know, Rex Tillerson, who is now Secretary of State, uh, used to be the uh, head of Exxon. So this, of course, will certainly have effects, especially in relation to what the U.S. does, U.S. companies do in the Arctic, for instance. But I think it is too early to say. I mean, apart from what everyone knows here about what Trump has said, what is he going to do? I don't know. I have no special information about, uh, about this. Uh, but it is certainly the case that he's surrounded with people uh, which are very nasty people and, uh, and especially tied to oil interests uh, in, uh, in this administration. So we need to wait a little bit to see how words translate really or not uh, in, uh, in actions from that point of view. Will it, is it going to be a, a break from what the Obama era was from that point of view? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. Hola. Hola, has expuesto un problema, que, un problema que es muy central, que es eh, la, la negatividad de un, que tiene el sistema democrático o dentro de la democracia que nosotros practicamos yeah. por el short time. Yeah. O el short term. Entonces, eh, y después has añadido pues, una, bueno, una solución que aportó Jonas yeah. de una dictadura benevolente. Yeah. Yeah. Bueno, esto parece como casi un acto de fe o un acto de, de um, último, digamos, de esperanza. Pero, ¿cómo, yeah. ¿cómo crees que esto puede ser factible no. o dentro de qué parámetro? Y si la, si la democracia, digamos, que está yendo en perjuicio, digamos, de, de todo esta de todo este calentamiento global, del cambio climático, eh, ¿Qué, ¿Qué sugieres o qué, qué aportaciones o qué tendencias podría esto redimir este, esta falta, este, este problema? Well, obviously I'm, I don't agree with Hans Jonas, uh, but to be fair to his thinking, he was a great thinker, very interesting thinker. When he talked about the benevolent dictatorship, he had the Roman dictatorship in mind and not, of course, the dictatorships of the 20th century, which are, of course, very different types of dictatorships. So a Roman dictatorship is when a dictator takes over, saves democracy or saves the republic, and then hands back power. Well, this is an idealized form of dictatorship, of course, and it is difficult to imagine that that could happen today, but this is what he thought. So his argument basically is that democracy is too messy, so you can't. My argument, or the argument of eco-socialists or Marxists who think about uh, these, these matter, is that democracy, uh, on the contrary, is the solution. It is a solution, but it is not necessarily representative democracy. It is true, I think, that representative democracy takes much time. What we should do, it seems to me, at least this is something we should uh, think about, is uh, augment the part of direct democracy in these matters. Now, you said I was a member of the Swiss radical izquierda. Well, in Switzerland, I'm not saying everything is fine, far from it, but there's forms of 
in part, more direct democratic involvement of the people uh, through referendum, uh, popular initiatives. I mean, Switzerland is certainly not a left-wing country, far from it. But some experiments of that kind, it seems to me, uh, would be worth uh, trying. For instance, in the country where I live in, which is France, where there's very few initiatives of this type. So contrary to Hans Jonas, I'm a very strong believer in democracy, in representative democracy, but even more direct forms of democracy. We need the people to change the lives of the people. They need to be involved. If not, well, the changes will not take place, simply. If you want to change the, the paradigm uh, of their everyday living, well, you have to take people from where they are today and make the changes through them, with them. You cannot just say, well, we'll decide for the people uh, by taking over the state and then deciding from a benevolent dictatorship. That is not going to work. But he has a fair point, Hans Jonas. Representative democracies of the Western type are in fact very messy, contradictory, and they have a problem with time, certainly. Yeah. Sí, uh, este seminario <coughs> se llama Petróleo. Yeah. <laughs> y a todos nos queda muy claro la relación entre el ejército y el petróleo, las guerras por el petróleo. El cambio climático, a mi entender, añade un factor totalmente diferente al pico del petróleo, que es el problema del agua. Parece que las guerras uh, que vienen por el cambio climático tendrán que ver por el control del agua, como ya está sucediendo en Oriente Medio. La pregunta que te hago es si sabes si los ejércitos están planificando guerras por el agua. Um, they are certainly very conscious of the fact that this is going to be a very important central problem in the years and decades to come. And in fact, when I was talking about the concept of chaos specialist, the fact that the military will intervene in situations of chaos and be the only standing institution, this is how they describe themselves, the only standing institution, well, they often talk about uh, situations where water will lack and there's going to be water crisis. Uh, so they are very much aware of that, and they prepare for that, of course. This is, this is absolutely clear. But there's not, in my, to my knowledge at least, uh, a specific form of military intervention that is linked to the water issue. That is, on the battleground, tactically, it seems to me at least, to my knowledge, that there's not something specific to water. It's more generally natural resources that will be you know, uh, in uh, situations of scarcity that, that have uh, drawn the attention of the military. But I may be wrong. Bueno, eh, una pregunta sobre, con muy concreta sobre la afirmación esta tan tajante que, que hacías eh, de, acerca de cómo en el futuro previsible eh, la humanidad seguiría adelante. Mm, hay científicos importantes en el terreno del clima que discrepan de esa, de esa opinión. ¿no? Eh, Mencionó uno español, Antonio Ruiz Elvira, un climatólogo de, de por acá, ha afirmado en varias ocasiones que con <coughs> aumentos de temperatura de 6 grados, 7 grados, 8 grados, que están entre lo, lo que puede ocurrir en un siglo, eh, muy posiblemente la humanidad desaparecería. O sea, eso creo que no es una, una cuestión tan clara como... Ok, como no, 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 fair point. What is the time frame of that? Un siglo. Un siglo, ok, ok. Bad news, so... Yeah. I, 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 uh, I'm not a scientist myself and... The things I've read about this is, uh, are more, well, a bit different, but maybe that's possible. Sí. Bueno, esto de que la, los ejércitos hacen planificación sobre el cambio climático y las consecuencias no es nada nuevo. ¿eh? Eh, la ciencia, la física, eh, ha avanzado un montón. Sí. La ciencia y la física han avanzado un montón y los grandes avances, no los puedo cuantificar en porcentaje, pero son debidos a avances militares. Es decir, el florecimiento de la ciencia en Francia con los ejércitos de Napoleón es altamente conocido. En Alemania, la Segunda Guerra Mundial. Eh, no sé si recordáis, pero uno de los descubrimientos de la existencia del jet atmosférico que controla mucha gran parte del clima fue debido a un meteorólogo japonés que fue el que facilitó que se pudieran enviar 
bombas a través de globos desde Japón a Estados Unidos. Y fue un experimento que los eh, americanos no entendieron y que al final dieron cuenta es que resulta que hay un jet atmosférico que nos une Japón con Estados Unidos. Eh, es normal, es decir, eh, la instrumentación en ciencias medioambientales viene de, la, de los ejércitos americano, inglés y ruso eh, toda la instrumentación todos los, eh, todos los vehículos autónomos todo esto sale de la, de la Navy luego es normal que hagan estas planificaciones y es normal que actualmente muchos de los modelos de clima vengan de la Navy eh, yo creo que la diferencia es que hasta ahora casi, casi todos los conflictos han venido por eh, la competencia por recursos, el que sea, el petróleo ahora, pero los romanos buscaban plata y bronce y otras cosas, o sea, no es nada nuevo en la historia, lo único que ha cambiado es que como la población, digamos, ahora es mucho mayor, un desastre climático localizado produce el movimiento de la población, y la pobla que esto es... Antes era más fácil porque ibas de un sitio para otro y encontrabas otro ambiente donde podías tú colonizar y de alguna manera había conflictos, pero ahora es que es imposible y, y nos pasa a nosotros y les pasa a las especies naturales. Es decir, los osos del Ártico, cuando el Ártico se funda, no se van a morir porque el, 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 el hielo se funde, se van a morir porque cuando lleguen a Canadá lo primero que va a pasar es que los van a matar. Esto está pasando actualmente. Yo conozco gente que va a investigar al Ártico y lo que llevan son dos o tres policías que van con armas y cuando aparece un oso lo matan. Por el bien de la ciencia. No estoy inventando nada. Esto ha pasado y está pasando. Es decir, lo que estamos consiguiendo, lo que hemos conseguido es impedir la capacidad de adaptación de la gente. En Siria la gente tiene una sequía, como ha pasado en la historia en muchos sitios, y ahora no pueden hacer otra cosa que emigrar. Y cuando emigran se encuentran un muro, en el mejor de los casos, y en el peor, un muro desde el cual le disparan. Y esa es la fuente de los conflictos ahora y creo que es la novedad por la cual los eh, militares están preocupados. Es decir, ahora ya no es una competencia por controlar los recursos, porque creo que ya el capitalismo ha conseguido controlar todos los recursos, las explotaciones en el Ártico podrán ven, venir por quién paga los impuestos, pero las empresas que van a pinchar en el Ártico los hidrocarburos serán las de siempre. En Estados Unidos Exxon está pinchando en Siberia y la rusa está pinchando en otro sitio y Aranco en otro sitio y China tiene eh, cubierta, hace, hace busca de hidrocarburos por todas las partes del mundo. O sea, el capitalismo ya ha conseguido esa batalla. Ahora la diferencia es que hay movimientos enormes de población debido a desastres asociados al cambio climático. ¿Y cómo manejamos eso? O sea, el problema es si se inunda, sabemos que si sube el nivel del mar, toda la península de Florida va a quedar inundable. Bueno, lo lógico sería planificar dónde va a ir a parar esa gente, porque tenemos medios. Por tanto, lo lógico sería decirle a toda la gente que vive en Florida, marcharos, porque esto se va a inundar. ¿Y dónde van? Yo creo que esta es la nueva fuente de conflictos, que es la incapacidad de las especies a readaptarse en un espacio finito. Por tanto, lo que necesitamos es socializar los problemas, de tal manera que lleguemos a un acuerdo de, cuando pasa eso, acoger en vez de rechazar. Con, con el resto de los humanos y con el resto de las especies, ¿no? Ah, fully agree.